from shouting men shoveling paper around to a button on your phone, stock exchanges have offered a market for over 600 years. But what influence do politics and technology and the stock market industry have on the price? Does the market balancing the needs of buyers and sellers still provide a fair foundation? And will this 600-year-old industry stand the test of time? Here to talk about the ups and downs of the stock exchange is Simone Hauer-Sinnefeld. She's the CEO of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange with over 20 years of senior management experience in the financial industry. We are very excited to welcome her on our stage. This is Anne-Louise, my name is Patrick, and now let's have a warm round of applause for Simone. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Please sit down. So, uh, we are very excited to welcome her. So, first of all, um, how do you feel being back at the Uber event? Yeah, that's a long time ago. Uh, I will not say how many years, because then you can uh, guess my age. But uh, <laughs> no, it's good. And I have studied also on Rutherstraat, Ruther Island. Yes, I've been here before, but that's a long time ago. A different building, different bridge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you mentioned sociology. Um, it's not the first thing I think of when, when I think of finance. So how did you end up in this field? I think it has a lot to do with finance. I think uh, also the capital market and the financial market has everything to do with people and how people interact and how companies interact in the economy. It's all kind of actors in the economy. So I think it has everything to do with the uh, financial capital market. And it's uh, good to have uh, different uh, professions uh, with uh, people with different backgrounds in the financial industry. So I think I can add a lot of value. Mm -hmm. Do you think sociology graduates make better CEOs? No, I don't think so. But I, you can have different backgrounds. Uh, I think the combination of different type of people, different mm -hmm. style, uh, leadership styles, etc., that makes a good team. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't in the financial industry, what would you do instead? A police agent. Okay. Yes. I've always wanted to be a police agent. So Why? maybe later when I'm older and grown up, Maybe I will do so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to start off, um, in one sentence, what is a stock exchange? In one sentence, that's <laughs> <laughs> very difficult. But it's a place where supply and demand of capital meet. So where company, companies can raise money to grow and to innovate sustainably. Uh, and where investors, and that are private investors and institutional investors, uh, can uh, invest and uh, grow their investments in, in value. I think. It's one sentence? <laughs> it's a very long sentence. A long sure. sentence, <laughs> yes. But it is important for the economy. Mm. Okay, so that is kind of the general overview. So what makes the Amsterdam Stock Exchange special then? Well, a, l a lot of things. So th that's always the question, why are companies listing in Amsterdam? Or why uh, people trade on Amsterdam? If you look to, to the, uh, the capital market, if you look to the exchanges, there is a huge competition between exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, and from a theoretical point of view, um, each exchange provides access to the same group of international institutional investors. So it doesn't make a lot of uh, difference if you list in London, in New York or in Amsterdam. But what we see that uh, in the past, Amsterdam was looked at as an alternative for London. Mm -hmm. Now, Europe and Amsterdam is first looked at. And I, so? Yeah, I think there are three reasons. So uh, why they choose for Euronext, why they choose for Amsterdam, because we have seven exchanges, mm -hmm. and why they choose for the Netherlands. Um, I think for Euronext, it's about our uh, trading platform, uh, our, the, the quality of our trading book, uh, the listing process, uh, but we also do a lot of upstreaming uh, prospect things. So with uh, younger companies who are uh, interested to list, we have educational programs. Um, then we have seven exchanges in Euronext, so why do they choose Amsterdam? And what we hear back from investors and from uh, potential uh, companies who want to list and their advisors is that each country has their own specifics. So for example, in Norway, we see many companies in shipping, in, uh, in uh, energy. Uh, in Italy, for example, it's the four Fs. It's furniture, fashion, food, and Ferrari. Uh, in uh, France, it's luxury goods and automotive. In the Netherlands, it's definitely technology, media, and telecom companies. So we have Agen, uh, Azamel, 
uh, Wolf Skluwer, Universal Music Group, KPN, and international companies. And uh, the international companies, uh, they are here because a lot of investors coming from abroad in the Netherlands. So 75% uh, uh, of the invested capital in the listed companies in the Netherlands is coming from abroad. And for the AAX companies, it's even 90%. And then in turn, because we have those inter international investors, international companies are interested to list here in Amsterdam. Uh, so that's an, 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 a turn. So in, in international investors attract international companies and international companies attract international investors. So that's the, the two things uh, Amsterdam is uh, good in, international companies, telecom, media and um, tech companies. But also the Netherlands is offering a very favorable business climate for, for companies. It's uh, the taxation, it's social law, corporate law, and our governments, the, the, the government's rules. So in the Netherlands, dual share class are allowed, mm -hmm. that you have different voting rights. And for founders who are going public, go to the market, uh, they are very interested in that, and especially the first couple of years to main control. But also our educational level, the good universities uh, in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, of course, uh, the English uh, language, uh, internet connections, and uh, what, what always also good from the Netherlands is um, the predictable and reliable governments and, uh, and regulators. That's not what we see in every country. Right. Mm. And in which way do you collaborate with these other exchanges in your next? Do you share resources or how exactly do you go about that? Yeah. Now to start off, we have one trading platform, one liquidity book, one order book. So that's what we share with the seven exchanges. You share liquidity? Yes, it's one liquidity pool. So we have an exchange in, in, in Oslo, in Amsterdam, Brussels, Dublin, uh, Paris, Lisbon and Milan. And we share one order book, one liquidity pool. And then the board of Euronext uh, exists of the seven local CEOs. So each local CEO is a member of the board. And in the board, we discuss uh, the strategy and all kinds of challenges we are facing. Uh, so uh, M&A or organic growth, uh, IT developments and innovation, sustainability, um, but also uh, the current developments, of course, uh, the, um, uh, what's happening in the world uh, with uh, inflation, recession, um, uh, the in interest rates, and also the geopolitical situation, of course, uh, has a lot of impact on cybercrime, uh, the economic sanctions. So that are the topics we discuss in the board. And then in Amsterdam, just like in Paris, just like in Milan, people are not working only for the country itself, but for the group. So in Amsterdam, for example, we have market surveillance and we, we monitor the derivatives markets in the whole of Europe. We have uh, the market data department where you are uh, interested in, I think, uh, indices, uh, compliance, that are departments, they're working for the group, not only for Amsterdam. So it's integrated exchange. Right. And, and for your customers, what would you say is the advantage of having this pan-European network? It's the large investor pool, one liquidity pool. So if you list on Euronext, it's not only um, uh, the, the order book in Amsterdam, it's in Europe and a liquidity pool and investors for those so seven markets. Hmm. So you're mentioning um, a different couple of stock exchanges in the part of Euronext. I think Frankfurt was missing in that list. Why London. is Frankfurt part of Euronext? Yeah, or London, <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> yeah, we have seen many, many uh, M&A consolidation spin-offs in the last two decades in this uh, capital market area. And I, I know in the past they have tried to merge, mm. uh, but that was not allowed by the European Commission. So the question is, uh, do we need one large European exchange covering all the European countries? Uh, which is not the case now, or do we want um, to have competition in the market? Uh, and that's what we have. I think consolidation is not done yet, so we acquired uh, Borsa Italiana, the Italian exchange, last year, in the year before, Dublin and Oslo. So we are really interested in M&A. Consolidation is not done yet, but the question is, will it end in one large exchange in Europe, or do we always have one or two or three exchanges? Hmm. Do you think eventually you will have one exchange? So the idea is in, the, in Europe to have one European capital market and um, that will take a long time and I do think 
that more consolidation is needed in, in Europe because we have Deutsche Börse and we have Euronext. Uh, we have uh, six, uh, in, that's the Swiss and Spain uh, market, and then a lot of very small exchanges. I think uh, you need the scale. Uh, you need to have a large order book uh, to have a an, an, an fairly uh, price formation process. So consolidation will not be done. Where it ends, I don't know. Okay. Uh, we're now talking about European capital markets and Euronex is more of a financial project, but does it have political aspects as well? Yes, sure. So uh, when I was appointed, also the minister, minister of Finance uh, have to, to appoint me. So it's definitely political. And if we uh, are in processes of taking over exchanges in other countries in Europe, the government is in that process big time. So for each country, it's really important to have a regulated exchange with an, an, uh, an orderly and, and fairly and, and transparent price uh, formation process, also for the, the private investors like we are. Mm. You were just emphasizing the importance of European capital markets. Um, do you think that the development of Euronet is a pan-European stock exchange? Could that, uh, is that possible without the EU, kind of the economic or the commercial side as well, the political parallel stream to it? So, uh, no, I don't understand the question. Mm. So basically the um, consolidation of a pan-European stock exchange yeah. would, or is, would have that been possible without the EU? Um, or the emergence of the EU? Yes, because I think the market is asking for it. Uh, if you compare Europe with uh, the US, we are really, really fragmented. Mm -hmm. And I think that consolidation is needed. To what extent, I don't know. But um, I, I do think that uh, aiming for a European capital market, that the European Commission would also love to see that there is more consolidation in Europe in the capital market too. Why would they love to see it? Um, to have one transparent market, also for you as an investor, the larger the market is, the more investment opportunities you have. And for companies to grow and to innovate, also now with sustainability, that needs to be financed. Mm -hmm. So a capital market is needed to finance the sustainability. Then a, a larger market with more investors in there is good for the economy in Europe. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now we have a short rapid fire plan. We will ask you seven questions oh dear. where you can on only answer yes or no. And I will start off. Um, competition is higher with London than with Frankfurt. Yes, I agree. Oh yes, only yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two extra words, okay. Uh, you can still find people shouting on the trading floor. No. Euronext treats all market participants equally. Yes. For first-time investors, like our students, the AEX offers an easy entry. Yes. It is Euronext's role to protect investors from dubious companies. Yes. Euronext will exist in 30 years. Do exist? Yeah. Yes, certainly. <laughs> the customers of the Euronext are mostly large liquidity providers. No. Okay. Uh, who are your customers? Uh, yes, so we have members who can trade on our market. So you as private uh, investors cannot directly trade on our market. You need a broker for that. So we have brokers, we have liquidity providers. Um, not sure if everybody is, knows what liquidity providers are, so very short explanation. Um, liquidity providers provide liquidity on our, our market. So they are in the market all day with uh, offering bid and ask uh, so the moment you want to buy or sell shares, you can always do that because of those liquidity providers. So they are important, but it's not only liquidity providers, so brokers, asset managers, uh, banks, um, we have 150 members on our market. That are our clients and then our, of course our issuers, the companies who are <coughs> listed on our market. Okay, you, you mentioned what a stock exchange is at the beginning. Um, how exactly do you make money? We make money, uh, we, know, we call it the primary market, so companies who want to list, they have to pay if they want to list, and then a yearly fee. So that's the listing process, and we offer a lot of products and services to those uh, listed companies too. Then we have the secondary market, that is trading. Uh, so to trade uh, directly, yeah, institutional parties, members on our market, pay a fee, 
uh, and you as a private investor via your broker pay also a fee. Uh, and then we have the post trade market, that's the administration afterwards, so um, the clearing and settlement. Um, and that is also with a fee for companies uh, and for traders. And market data, of course. Could you could you give us a brief overview of, of the, the build-up of your revenue? How, how what is the percentage of uh, your your income on on market data, for example? Yeah. Uh, and how much do you earn from these fees? Yeah. yeah you can say one third market data, one third uh, trading, and one third uh, listing, and the rest. Okay. Um, Coming back to the fees, um, how does the Amsterdam Stock Exchange attract IPOs? Um, yeah, so what I said, there is a, a huge competition, so uh, we try to get at the table uh, as soon as possible with potential uh, uh, candidates for an IPO, for companies who want to go public. So we offer all kinds of educational programs, we call it tech share and go public to educate people what it means if they go public and how they have to prepare themselves to go public. Um, and of course we have a full ecosystem in the Netherlands, the advisors and bankers etc. who help companies to go public and uh, we are in close interaction with them to see what's happening in the market, who is interested, how can we help them etc. I can imagine it's, um, it's, it's striking a balance between attracting these IPOs but also protecting your customers from dubious companies. So um, how exactly do you do that? So for the listed companies, uh, what we do now, for example, with sustainability, uh, all listed companies have to think about their position uh, regarding ESG. So we offer, for example, all kinds of uh, services to the issuers uh, to help to prepare them uh, how to talk to investors to, to understand what they think is important regarding ESG and how they can act on that and report on that. Uh, so we have uh, advisory services and educational programs to help the issuers regarding ESG, as, a, as an example. And obviously there is a regulator that sets these standards. Do you set your standards higher than those of the regulator to ensure more safety? If it's about ESG, no. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to uh, the taxonomy and all kind of uh, clear regulations around it. Uh, and then to help our issuers to implement it. It's not that we set the standard higher. Let's first implement uh, what uh, the new regulations in this regard are, mm -hmm. and that we implement that orderly. Mm -hmm. Do you feel no pressure? Because you are, of course, competing with other exchanges to lower your standards. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, because uh, you asked uh, the competition, and you mentioned uh, London. Uh, and there is always a risk now also with Brexit uh, that if uh, London is lowering the standards then we have to lower the standards. For now it's not necessary. Um, I think London is lowering the standards to come up to par to Europe. Um, but it, it's a balancing act because lowering the standards, if that means that we can uh, not uh, offer an, an orderly market anymore, it's not good. So um, we also have a role to fulfill in society to offer a capital market that is rel reliable and transparent. Mm. All right. Um, so we talked about a lot about IPOs, kind of as a way to make money and getting companies um, at the stock exchange listed. So once they're listed, you can buy or sell the stock according to a certain price. So according to textbook economics, a price is a reflection of the interaction between demand and supply in the market. Yeah. Pretty much what you uh, said in your one sentence uh, description of the stock yeah. exchange. Yeah. So if you look at current markets today, how good are they at valuing the stock? Yeah. So if you look to the theory, I think the, the share price should reflect uh, the net present value of the future profit growth of a company. Uh, and there is a famous quote in the capital market saying the market is always right, meaning that you should always regard uh, the, the market as um, efficient and right in valuing companies and shares. And the question indeed is, is that true? Mm, how realistic is that? Yeah, and you could argue that in the, in the real economy maybe it is true, but we have seen in the past that the capital market does not always reflect uh, the, the real economy. And I think there are three reasons for that. 
Um, the first one is uh, rational and irrational behavior. So rational behavior is that you're looking at the share price as the, the, re the, the, the present value of future profit growth. Mm -hmm. But irrational behavior is what we also see in the markets. And that is, I don't know, uh, fear, greed, all kinds of emotions. And that's also impacting the valuation of a share price and a company. The second one, I think, is uh, internal and external factors. So if you want to buy a share and you look to the internal factors, that is the net present value of the future profit growth. But you have a lot of external factors, uh, the geopolitical situations, interest rates down or up, inflation, recession, Ukraine, COVID, what we have seen in the last two years had a huge impact. So those in external factors can also influence the share price and the valuation of a company. And then the third thing, what we see is directional and non-directional trading. So directional trading is that you look at the company and look at future profit growth and decide if you want to buy a share or sell a share. But uh, non-directional behavior is uh, indeed about the high frequency traders, the market makers, and they don't care if the price is going up or down, they just want to make money uh, in the liquidity in the market, so they always have to be in the market, but they and they, uh, that's why they are so important. Um, but they 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 also make money with the uh, with the bid and ask prices in the market. That's more indirectional uh, trading, and that's also uh, has uh, consequences for the share price. So mm. that are three factors where you can say maybe uh, it's not an, uh, the, the, the good valuation. On the other hand, what we also see is more algorithm trading, so less human interaction. Mm. And then you can argue uh, they are looking to historical patterns and extrapolate that to the future, so it's more objective, more factual. So that could be the other side. But below the line, I think the market is efficient, but not always right. Mm. We've also seen a rise in passive investing. Yeah. Uh, I think especially for students' um, ETFs. A yeah. uh, great way to um, kind of have a first experience with the stock market. However, they also just passively resemble a certain index um, depending on which they are built upon. Um, so there's also like no active kind yeah. of person in there. Uh, what consequences does that have for the market? Yeah, I would have add, could have added that in non-directional trading indeed. Mm -hmm. So uh, passive trading is also a little bit non-directional trading and has impact on the share price. Mm -hmm. It has also impact with IPOs mm -hmm. because also? if you are an, um, a passive trader, you do not uh, step in when a company goes uh, public. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has definitely impact on our market uh, with IPOs and with non-directional trading, which has impact on the price. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, is uh, Tesla really worth more than the next 10 car factories combined? <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, for many, many reasons, uh, I cannot answer your <laughs> question very precisely. <laughs> uh, and I think you are all kind of economic students, so you can do the math of yourself. <laughs> okay, um, to move on to this algorithmic trade, if I buy stocks on my phone, is it really the same thing than when a hedge fund um, using high, than when a high, when a hedge fund buys stocks using high frequency algorithms? And what would be the difference in your view? The technical aspects of it. No, so if you, so assuming that you are in an app that is related to a broker, because you also have a lot of products on your phone in apps, and and then you are not dealing in on an exchange, right? With all kinds of new products. Um, so there's a difference between trading and investing. But assuming that you are investing via a broker, um, they have access to our order book. Um, the high uh, frequency trader also have access to our uh, trading book. But it can be that he's co-located in our data center. So the, their uh, machines are uh, located in our data center next to our matching engine. And that can be that it's microseconds quicker than if you give an order via your broker. Um, so that's, that's often the question, so what are the differences? So all our servers are available, but not suitable, because I think for a Dutch broker, it's, it's not necessary to, to be able in those microseconds 
uh, if you invest, that's because you have taken your decision as looking at, at all the factors we just discussed. And the high frequency traders are making money and they have to act very quickly on all market circumstances. So that's the, the difference. In the rapid fire, you mentioned that all market participants have equal access to the market. Does that still hold then? They, they can have equal access, it's available for everybody, but as a high frequency trader, you can decide for co-location and make sure that your machine is next to our matching engine. So there is a barrier to entry with high yes, costs, for example? Yeah, but that, that indeed, is, it, that costs money, uh, which in return they will earn back because they are very fast in trading. As, an, as a retail investor, the question is, is that necessary? Are you a, a trader, daily trader, buying, selling all day? Then that would be interesting. So in theory, there is equal access to the market, but in practice? It's available for everybody, but not suitable. So if your broker has uh, clients like you, you want to buy Tesla shares and keep them, you are not trading during the day, buying, selling Tesla during the day, then it's not necessary. Hmm. So we've seen the technology is different depending on who the market participant is. Um, if you look at the information available, do you think that's also equally distributed among retail and private investors? Um, so as a retail investor, you, you, you have that access. Uh, high frequency traders uh, have access not only to our market, it's not, you have different markets worldwide, mm. the US and Europe and all the exchanges, so liquidity providers uh, buy the market data of every exchange in the world and all other kind of trading platforms. They combine it in one algorithm and they are trading on it, so they buy on Euronext and they sell on Deutsche Börse, for example. Mm. Uh, so they, their need for market data is different than you as a private investor. You want to see what the bid and ask is of Tesla. Mm. At the moment, you want to buy or sell something. And is this fair in respect to private investors? Yeah, I do not see the, this advantage. If you want to trade on a daily basis, then um, th there is access, but then you have to make sure you have that access. You have not that access via your Dutch broker. If you want to, to trade daily, there are also possibilities to see all that data. All right. All right, let's see if it's really fair. Um, we open the floor <laughs> for some audience questions. So you can just raise your hands in case you want to ask Simone a question. Yeah, we have one question, the guy with the glasses. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. Oh, we have a microphone. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, to introduce a little bit, I study political science, but I do work for online brokers, so that's why I found it interesting. And I had a question uh, regarding uh, politics, because sometimes I feel the clients at my broker, they want to uh, trade, for example, a lot of uh, German bonds or French bonds or very complex products, but they c cannot do so because of European regulations. And also, uh, when you compare it to US stock market retail access, and what you mentioned already, the consolidation is very restricted, so maybe you could also say that the European Union is actually standing in the way of a stronger European capital market system. Would you agree? or? It's a, a difficult balance between protecting private investors uh, uh, and, and having an open market and that they have access to whatever they want to trade with. Uh, but we, we also see a lot of products in the market with a huge risk. And it's important that retail investors understand completely what they are doing. Uh, and I think what the European Commission is doing is making uh, the, um, to look into if, if, if you can expect from an, uh, a retail investor that they have the knowledge that they know exactly what the risks are to trade in such a product. And it can be that it's decided that it's too complex uh, and not suitable for private investors. But it is, a, it is a balance. Okay, okay. Uh, let's move on to the guy with the hat. Um, sorry, what's your current opinion on the direction of the equity market? Like, do you think it's an overreaction? Because basically the puts to call ratio is at an all time high since 2008. Everyone is bearish, everyone is expecting a recession. Do you think it's an overreaction or do you think 
it's actually what's going to happen in the future and should we prepare for a hard recession? <laughs> yeah, no, so doing projection is, is uh, difficult for me, I cannot do that, but what I can say is more about the past, that is really interesting, if you look to the AAX uh, index, so yesterday it closed at 700, and we have seen interesting patterns in the, in the last uh, years, um, but also in the last decades. Uh, we have seen the, the Tulip bubble, uh, wars, uh, the uh, dot-com bubble, financial crisis, uh, COVID, Ukraine, and it has a huge impact on the prices and also now inflation indeed and a recession and uh, uh, the, the interest rates going up. And what you see yesterday is that um, the interest, uh, no, the, um, the recession or the inflation number in the US uh, was... Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, you, you can answer the question. <laughs> so then you saw indeed that the tech companies, uh, that their um, uh, price was going up. Uh, but also in COVID, uh, we are coming from 400 during COVID and then uh, it, it was announced monetary stimuli, uh, vaccines, and it went up. And then one and a half year later, we had uh, all-time records at uh, 829, it's now going back at 700. Yeah, it's a lot of news in the world, uh, which has a huge impact on the, on, on the value of stocks and companies. Uh, and what we also now see if now the, in, in the uh, interest rate is going up, is a rotation in sectors. So you see uh, investors are going from uh, the Europe, Europe to the US, from equity to bonds, from growth stock, which are tech companies, to value stocks. And yesterday we saw going back, rotation back from value stocks to growth stocks. So um, that's why we have a, a lot of volatility in the market. Yeah, and, and what will the future bring? I don't know. Maybe if you, if you know, everybody would love to hear it. <laughs> is saying that, oh, the central banks are tightening the, basically the circulation of money because yeah. they're raising interest rates very aggressively, yeah. but also at the same time, we are technically in a recession, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, everyone is very, very, sort of has a negative opinion about the future. I, was, I just wanted to see if it's an overreaction or not. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a, a unique situation and I think that the European Commission and the central banks are struggling how to act. And uh, importantly, with what I said, what we have seen in the past with all the events, it's not helping us to, to tell us what to do now. So I think it's a struggle uh, to push which button. All right, let's have uh, a look if there's more questions. Um, someone over here? In the middle. All right. Uh, have you noticed any growth in skepticism towards uh, the free market system that the stock market currently relies upon uh, as of late? No. Can you specific? Uh, well, specific? Um, among the many crises that sort of have been fallen uh, as of late with COVID, with climate change, with the, the war in Ukraine, which has put a pretty harsh strain on uh, the market. Have you noticed any skepticism towards the free market system as a whole, um, sort of a political movement towards uh, more restriction or more governmental influence um, as of late uh, compared to before? Um, or has it sort of been like this all the time? Yeah, no, uh, not really. What we have seen during COVID is that some of the countries in Europe uh, prohibited uh, to go short so uh, um, and it turned out um, afterwards it, uh, that, that that had no need so it's not good for the market to intervene so I think especially also in the Netherlands the regulators and the Ministry of Finance do not want to intervene too much so as less as possible and let the market do the job so I don't see that at the moment no all right final question on the left here. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a genie lecturer in political science here at the UFA. Um I just wanted to ask, um, 
BlackRock um, are a company, I don't know what that particular thing is, that they, they at least work with, if not trading on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, if I'm, if I'm right. Um, and they're currently in conflict with Zambia uh, and the Zambian government about the cancellation of debts. Um, given that Zambia is in the middle of a huge debt crisis um, and debt payments um, are, are basically amounting to more than health, education and social protection spending combined. Um, after a request to cancel some of that debt during the coronavirus pandemic, BlackRock was one of the private lenders which didn't do so, um, which has led to the uh, declining living standards in, um, in Zambia. Do you think that stock exchanges like the one in Amsterdam um, have some kind of responsibility for the social consequences of products that are tr either traded there, I don't know whether the Zambian debt in particular actually is on the Amsterdam market or not, or at least to help ensure yeah, just about the social consequences of that. Yeah, this is not traded on our market and I don't know uh, this specific issue or situation, so uh, difficult to react on that. Uh, but as an exchange, of, and we are listed ourselves, and, and we also are working on our own ESG standards and uh, the S of ESG is social and, and governance, so uh, we are really we we have an obligation in all the countries in which we are operating to um, to make sure that we are also working on a sustainable agenda of that country, uh, and we have to be sustainable ourselves and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is not listed or traded on our market, so I don't know the situation exactly. But uh, we we have. Uh, to be responsible in the countries we operate and uh, to, uh, to report to society in general we are responsible for what we are doing. But I would have expect questions about crypto or something. But <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually an easy segue because that's the next topic we really want to get oh. into. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, we really want to talk with you about emerging technologies. Yeah. So, for example, blockchain technology, crypto, and there are also alternative ideas of trading, like over-the-counter um, exchanges or exchanges with a different um, philosophy. So do you see those emerging technologies, like blockchain, for example, more of a competition to your business model or as a way to improve your business? No, it's, it's an opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And just like in the past, uh, like algorithm trading and uh, the digitalization of trading and um, uh, real-time trading, this is also something that's coming by. And then as a, as a stock exchange, we have to look into it and adapt. And this is an, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So this is for issuing shares, to trade shares and to administrate shares. Um, and so, and, and, and it is possible. So, uh, but we do need to compl the complete ecosystem and value chain to work with that mm -hmm. in order to, to let it work. And we participate in several pilots, and we are able to issue, to trade, and to administrate shares on blockchain. But till now, it's not cheaper and not faster. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yeah, that's the technology and the whole ecosystem in the cooperation. Mm. Uh, I think the moment we can make it cheaper and faster, this can be the way forward. And that's why we always participate in all kinds of pilots and working together with the whole ecosystem to mm. see uh, when and how we can implement it. And, uh, and that's what we're investing in. Okay, let's just say for a moment that the technology is viable in terms of matured more. Um, what are possible use cases within a stock exchange for that? Sure, yes. The moment it's it's better for our clients, it's cheaper, it's faster, we will step in. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and in which areas do you see that, for example, blockchain could play a role in your business model? Yeah, so in, in issuing mm -hmm. shares, so in, in primary markets, companies going public. What would that look like? A tokenized. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, the whole administration mm -hmm. and trading on blockchain. Okay, yeah. um, so these are interesting ideas, um, however we also talked about the role of regulators 
and the financial industry, stock exchanges obviously included, are quite heavily regulated, I would say. So can stock exchanges really be an innovative force in such a strict regulatory environment? Uh, as long uh, as it's in the regulated uh, policies, it's, it's, it's possible. So mm. in, in the pilots we are participating, we always do that with the regulators. Mm, okay. So also regulators see going forward, this can be an interesting option. Uh, so that's what we are exploring. Mm. Usually the technology has an edge over the current legislature or the view of the regulator. How high or how far do you think that gap is? between the regulator um, being acceptable of new technologies versus you or the market is willing to implement them? As long as we can uh, guarantee an orderly, fair, transparent market with blockchain, mm -hmm. then the regulators are fine and we are fine. Mm -hmm. um, we can guarantee now the orderly, fair and transparent market, only it's not cheaper and not faster. Mm, okay. So that's what the, the, where we are waiting for. In, in contradiction with cryptos, that's not regulated yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we do see is that regulators gradually accepting the concept of cryptocurrencies. We do see that uh, institutional investors more and more getting interested. Mm -hmm. The prediction is that the retail participation will grow with more than 400% in the coming years, but still there is no regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, Regulation will come up in Europe in the coming year or years, and that's the moment uh, we can step in. Do you think as crypto markets mature, will they look more like current stock exchanges, or will maybe stock exchanges, as we see them now, change more to crypto exchanges? Yeah, so crypto now isn't currency, right? So we have an exchange on foreign forex exchange. Mm. So it, we, we are not only trading shares or uh, derivatives or bonds, but also forex, forex exchange, warrants and certificates, uh, commodities, energy, indices and ETFs. So we, we trade a lot. We are already trade currencies, mm. but that's foreign, foreign exchange. Crypto is a currency, so yes. that's something different. And the moment there is regulation, we can see if we want to step in with um, as a currency, as a derivative. Uh, we do trade um, current uh, um, ETFs already. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, my, my, this is going wrong. Okay, it's falling uh, off. Sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, now it's back. Um, so that's as a currency. Uh, a blockchain is more the technology mm. part of that. Mm. Okay, so we talked about some alternative ideas of what the market could look like. Do you still think there will be a need for traditional stock exchanges as the AAX in the future? Yeah, yes, I do think so. Uh, what I said uh, as an essence, what is, a, what is an exchange? That mm. is uh, supply and demand of capital uh, for companies to uh, obtain financing, for investors to uh, grow their investments. There will always be a need for that. Mm. Uh, as an exchange, it's very important that we continue to develop, to innovate, to transform, as we have done in the past, uh, and, and we will do so in the future. Uh, we do have to innovate and to adapt and to be, stay relevant for all our stakeholders, investors and companies. Mm -hmm. But to have a regulated, transparent market where the price formation is, is orderly and fair, um, I think that will be crucial also going forward, if that is on blockchain, if that is uh, cryptocurrencies, whatsoever. Currently, um, it is mostly large corporations that are listed. Um, what is your vision on uh, the so-called MKB Nederland? Yeah, the Smaller SMEs. Companies. Yeah, that's uh, an, a complex issue indeed. So if we look to the um, uh, companies listed on our market, 30% is international. Uh, and with IPOs, it's even 50%. And that's because of the international investor pool, indeed. Um, we do have small caps, but uh, you need to have a market capitalization of 200 to 400 uh, million euros in order to be able to, to get listed on the Amsterdam exchange. In other Euronext countries, that's much lower. And that's because of the whole ecosystem in that country. So, the Netherlands is so international oriented that also our institutional investors are so international oriented and not mainly focusing on Dutch companies. 
in Norway, in, in France or in Italy, what you see it's more uh, focused on local companies and investors want to invest locally. There's a whole ecosystem focused on the, on the local financing. And that's not the case in the Netherlands, which is a pity and therefore more difficult for smaller companies to get listed in Amsterdam because it's so international. Yeah. Is that something you're working on? Yes, very, very hard. <laughs> and we cannot do it alone. We need the ecosystem, you need the banks, the advisors who are also focused on the more larger international companies. Um, you need investors willing to invest in if, if a, a smaller company goes public. Um, inter because we have the international investor base, they are interested also to invest in local Dutch companies. That's not the case, but they want to see how we call it cornerstone investors. So Dutch companies or investors willing to step in as a cornerstone investor with an IPO. And as long as we have uh, for 25% local cornerstone investors, those international investors are really willing to step in. But we need Dutch investors as a starting point. And that's, that's an issue, because we are so internationally oriented. But further consolidation aid with this, is that... Uh, um, no, in this case, not. And uh, therefore, one of the reasons where, when I think it's important that you have local exchanges is for the visibility of local companies, for local investors. All right, then we come to the last question yeah. of today. So An easy one, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we look back uh, at stock exchanges 30 years ago, we see actual humans shouting on the trading floor. Um, what current aspect of a stock exchange will be outdated in 30 years' time? Oh, yeah, it is a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely the technology. I okay. think that will go very, very fast. If it's about uh, blockchain, distributed ledger technology, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, um, those kind of things, I think that will change big time, very, very fast in the coming years. Yeah. Mrs. Eisenfeld, we would like to thank you very much for being with us today. And we would like to thank our audience as well. Uh, please check our social media, our Spotify, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, and our upcoming interviews are also uh, IX listed. In fact, it's the parent company of Albert Heijn, Ethos, and many more. It's Ahal Del Hayes. And we'll have it on Tuesday next week. Thank oh, you very much. We thank hope to see much. you there. Thank you. Thank you.